Hey guys, it's Lucy. There are four books today that I really wanted to share with you. So the first two are kind of dark, but I really, really recommend. And then the second two um, are more along the lines of um, Japanese-centric topics that I would still recommend, but with some caveats or hesitations. So let's get into it. Um, the first one, I couldn't put down for... <laughs> And I didn't want this to end either. So this is the cult favorite House of Leaves um, by Mark Z. Danielusi. Okay, so the pronunciation of the author's name aside, um, this is so dark and so gripping and so insanely weird um, that I really think um, you have to pick it up and just flip through to be able to, to see what I mean. Like, there are some very experimental formats. And like, for example, this page is all footnotes. And it is just, and there are some parts where, you know, it's like there are words that are slanted. The pages are just, it, it creates such a mood and I have never really seen this type of thing in any novel before. This book actually was an inspiration or something that I recalled from when I was 13 and one of my friends in school um, kept carrying this around for the longest time and he was fascinated by this. And at that time, I couldn't really understand and I wasn't really, I don't know, it just seemed kind of weird. I was into other historical or like, um, fantasy novels at that time, but I saw this in the bookstore, I flipped through, I couldn't put it down. This is, it's not a thriller in the mystery, in the generic, um, traditional, you know, thriller, mystery category at all. There is a narrative, or rather like a narrative and a narrative on top of a narrative at the same time, all of it fictional, but it feels real, like it's written in a in a non-fictional way but everything is completely and utterly made up um like this could even be a screenplay or like a um, like a play-by-play -play of a documentary even and at the core of it it's about a haunted house but it's not exactly a normal house of course like haunted we think like you know like spirits or you know poultry guys whatever but the house itself is the part that is haunting humanity. Like that's what's weird about it. So, and I was just thinking about this before making this review, you know, one of the things that struck me that I didn't really, I thought I picked up, but I didn't really think about was the fact that every single reference to the house is in a different font color. Like if you can see here, this is in a light blue color where it, where it references the maison or the house or anything like it, it's the house is basically singled out um, during the editorial process in color like that that in itself is kind of laborious every single page is basically color printed to pick up you know any reference to the house in light blue and I'm thinking like why why do that why that emphasis besides the fact that this house is kind of singled out as the haunted entity and I re and I realized one of the bibles that somebody had gifted me um, many many years ago I think it was an edition that is kind of common like if you're um, a Christian or if you go to church that edition is the one where every word that is said by God or Jesus himself if it has like the New Testament those words um, are singled out in a different color and I think it was blue as well um, and everything that had been written uh, by the disciples you know the, the book of whoever whoever or just narrative um, connecting passages of the Bible everything else was written in black so that connection tells me that like the metaphor that I think maybe the editor ed editors or the author was trying to make is that the house is this sort of otherworldly or something that does not belong to this world. Like it's, 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 I don't want to say like, um, compare it to any sort of, uh, um, like spiritual entity, but 
it, it kind of puts it in a whole different category. And that is a, it, it strikes you, but maybe not in the moment, but I think that's a very, very cool detail. So this book, um, <laughs> I, it's not just a story as well like of course that in itself like if you read this like during I don't know like around the Halloween time or like during the deep dark winter time if you live in the northern um, hemisphere this is such like cool vibes but it's haunting it is it the house in itself to me is a metaphor for all of our deepest darkest fears traumas whatever like all of that combined and it could and it shifts it's just it's different for each person it's different or maybe even the same like at a a, a scale of like a society it, you can take this in many ways i think this is one of those books where if you meet somebody who has also read this book or is a fan of this book or who doesn't understand this book it will be a very very cool conversation because there's so many aspects of this that can be left up to interpretation and discussed as yeah like even just just the story itself and also the details in you know the relationships between the different characters that could be analyzed in so many different ways as well and my mind was spinning like the whole time um i did mark one spot where you know when i went back like just now like it gave me chills again and this is that it's a very short passage of I think where the the title is um, coming from and it it captures this idea of this house so um, so the um, in brackets untitled fragment so we assume that this is like a fragment of a piece of paper that's like found in the house somewhere just unexplained and this is a house within the house by the way like that that eventually disappears um, so it says, little solace comes to those who grieve when thoughts keep drifting as walls keep shifting and this great blue world of ours seems a house of leaves, moments before the wind. I'm, I'm just going to leave it at that. This is, I think, one of the best reads in years um, in terms of as far as just fiction goes. So, okay, so moving on, the second one that, um, that I wanted to talk about is Smoke Gets in Your Eyes by, um, oh, and, and Other Lessons from the Crematory by Caitlin Doughty, or Doughty. So this lady, she spent years working in the funeral industry, and she talks about her experiences um, as a newbie, uh, <laughs> working in a funeral home um, in the back, you know, cremating bodies. And, and this is such different, like, tone from, from the House of Leaves. Just, like, this is also equally dark, maybe even more dark, actually. But it is written in such um, um, a personal way that's very... It, it, it's very relatable. Like, it's not about scaring people or um, you know, revealing deep dark secrets and, and, and any of that or anything really like actually dark. Um, like I mean, as an example, I'm seeing on the back by the Oprah magazine, um, the review uh, quoted is demonically funny. So I mean, it's not, um, it's, it's not throwing shade on the industry, but at the same time, it's talking about it in such a candid way that helps people really understand what goes on um, after death in a very realistic way, because none of us these days really understand what is involved, except maybe like, I mean, if you're, if you're a person who plans ahead, you're thinking, okay, maybe I need to buy a, pl a plot of land to be buried on, but like, the details of how you know your body gets handled and all of the other things that goes on in a crematory like there are a lot of other ways um, and a lot of other channels where death is being processed um, in, in, in a way that is beyond us so in this book because her tone is like as a newbie she is telling stories as she's coming um, to experience them from a professional perspective 
and I think it's so valuable to, and it's part of her um, aim as well, and aim and objective, to try to demystify this death denial culture in North America that, that we have built over just you know the last couple of decades, especially since um, you know including the practice of embalming, which is actually you know very it, it's very artificial, it's very unnatural, and it's only in the last couple of decades that that's become almost a very common, if not the default way for um, for a body to be uh, put to rest. So some, some of the things that gets discussed is so niche that you would never even think about it. Like, you know, what, what happens when you donate your body to science? Does it actually, you know, does it, does it go in whole to, you know, to a medical hospital? No, it doesn't. Like what happens with, um, you know, miscarriages, like um, where, you know, the fetus has, is slightly bigger or, you know, like what, how do people, um, how do the families react? Like, what do they prefer? Like, what? There are so many stories, and it's dis- again, it's described in a very candid. That's the only word I can think of that really captures her tone, candid, because she she's trying to almost heal herself as well from the trauma of you know, um, her, in her childhood of when uh, she saw an accidental death. Um, It was at a mall, I think some child fell um, from another floor. So since then, it's like she's been trying to put like a blindfold like on herself when it comes to death. And this is her way of like, like almost like a cognitive behavioral therapy where she's like plunging deep into her fear to try to overcome this, denial of death or yeah I mean it's not it's very admirable I don't think most of us realize that we have this fear that we're not going to be here forever or and even even whilst everything we do and the things we get you know tied up in all sorts of like addictions or like you know even everything we do almost seems to be trying to perpetuate our life or our memory or our mark on this earth um, that is in a way denying death as well like a lot of us are not at rest with this idea that we're not going to be here forever and it is not totally healthy and the way that the death industry has evolved doesn't help with this sort of uh, denial either so this is a very cool book for everyone I think in the developed world where we're used to this system of a very sanitary death I would say where we don't get to see what's what goes on the after death or even moments before death and we're very removed from um, this very crucial uh, part uh, spiritually um, part of life so I really recommend this it's extremely well written I think the author is a very kind-hearted person who is who has some very interesting ideas and i think she founded this thing called the order of the good death i haven't looked into it in a lot of detail but i feel like if i just put in that two minute uh google effort there it's something quite interesting so if you are not put off uh totally put off by the uh by the topic I think this is going to be a very um, rewarding read. So highly recommend this by Caitlin Doughty or Doughty. Um, Okay, so moving on to the last two books that I wanted to talk about. These two are, like I said, the Japanese centric ones. I don't fully recommend them to the general public just because I'll go into why. So the first one, it's called Japanese Folk Tales. It sounds very, very tame right? Like even something you might pick up for like a teenager or a child. And I definitely would not read this to my child if I, <laughs> if I had children. Anyway, so, and the reason is because there are these, these folk tales 
um, you know, by nature, they're, they're stories from the past, classic stories from Japan's enchanted past. And this is, I would almost look at this as an academic work or even from someone who, um, I'd like to collect folk tales because I think they show you a lot of insight into culture. So I look at it from like a sociological um, perspective and gain insight um, through that so this is not for like entertainment or especially for children um there a lot of these are translations from an earlier version and it's kind of credited in the preface i won't go into details some of so the i'll go i mean the downside first there are a lot of stories that perpetuate this idea of duty and loyalty and whilst those are very good qualities to um, place value on like as a society, I think because I'm coming from more of an individualistic uh, culture, uh, having lived in the West for most of my life, it really jars with my values. Like sometimes I read these and I feel really angry and I get really, cr like it's cringy for me to read some of these. And I think like, that's why I think it, it could be damaging almost in a way um, and against my own values if like to read these to children in today's society where I think we're moving more towards like a westernized sort of um, I idealism. Um, I think it holds you back some of these values. Um, for example, like there's one if if for anyone who's more like, you know, involved in Japanese like um, uh, history or uh, fairy tales there's this one the story of prince yamato take where you know his wife threw herself into the sea to in his place to to um to appease to the sea god that her husband had angered her husband who by the way uh whilst married to her um wanted to marry this other younger more beautiful princess that he met along the way when it was just like that kind of thing so it's very i just feel like it's very wrong and it's it, it goes against um current day studies for example the fact or the fact that i've gathered from um, the works of uh, dr Gabriel Mate, the fact that you know eighty percent of autoimmune diseases are um, you know diagnosed in women, and that link between mental health and this like people pleasing, um, like self, not self denial, but you know just that kind of niceness or in service of the family or others like that sort of attitude that that connection is i mean this is prince yamato take's wife would be like uh, candidate number one to get audio autoimmune disease that's the connection that i'm making here so that's why it kind of like and even without that connection to you know medical um consequences or like you know like that kind of thinking that it might be detrimental to personal health to always place oneself in the service of others at the expense of yourself or you know your potential or your dreams and goals and all of that anyway it get, I get very triggered by this type of loyalty and that is sprinkled out through many of these fairy tale stories in different ways I'm not talking about like husband wife like I'm also talking about children to you know has children to um, parents and also a, a sort of nationalism or patriotism like citizen to the country all of these um, are vastly exaggerated in these fairy tales compared to what is what i would consider reasonable or even reasonable in a fictional story sense um okay and i mean there are some really good ones i'll just end with that like um uh, the two that I really liked, um, well, where is it? There's one, Son of a Peach, Momotaro, the story of Son of the Peach. And there's another one about a bamboo cutter and the moon child. Um, so these are stories where like, you know, you have these like exceptionally strong or like beautiful or virtuous like people, um, but almost like 
um, semi gods, like they, they don't come from people. They come from like a peach, or they're coming from bamboo. But they are like gifts of the gods to um, to people who are childless, or you know, like that type of care of story setting. I think is quite unique to um, to fairy tales. Not I I want I wanted to say to Oriental like Eastern fairy tales, but I'm I'm not well versed in other fairy tales. I just yeah, it just seems more like of um, um, Chinese Japanese. I noticed this quite a lot. And I really like that because, in, in some sense, when the story is 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 depicted that way, where people are coming from other living things, it just means that um, the story itself it pits all living things at the same level. It's not that humans come from humans and um, you know like peach come from peach trees. Like it's almost we're all the, we're all one organism, and I really like that um, that sort of lack of hierarchy or distinction between living things. I think that is a very cool concept and I don't notice that too too much in, you know, like Grimm's or, you know, Western fairy tales that I've come across. So it is enjoyable, but I would recommend this for adults only because I feel like these ideas of values, it could seriously put into question or mess up even, I think, um, you know, in a productive way, like a young person's ideology. So I would be careful about fairy tales, especially Japanese ones like these. Um, another recommendation, um, how this one is, is really weird. So it's called No Longer Human, and the author is Osamu Dazai. This work is considered one of the, you know, is one of the best-selling um, books in Japan, like ever. But also, it's recognized as a fundamental piece of Japanese literature by Westerners as well. It's very short, and it's trans. It is translated. I recommend this only in the sense of its like literary importance. I think. Um, but personally, I don't quite understand this book. And also, it gives me, and that in itself, I think is very interesting because when you don't understand something, it means that there are some ideas in it that are seriously different than your own, and that is worth reflecting on. So this book, um, I noticed that because it's so popular, or at least maybe the English, the English uh, translation is, maybe there's been some kind of resurgence, um, but they actually made a graphic novel version of this. I'll link it if I can find it. So for people who like um, uh, graphic storytelling or manga, I feel like that could be a very interesting read as well. They actually quoted parts of this book in, that, in the graphic version as well. So I think obviously some of the literature that beautiful like prose or it's very it's written in a very beautiful way like some of that could be lost but I think the, the the big ideas are still there what I don't understand about this person is I mean it's everything this person the main uh, the main it's coming from um, the guy's voice like the narrator is the main protagonist he's describing his life he grew up in a fairly wealthy family but he just wasted his whole life and i don't really understand why like wasted in the sense that he got he got addicted um to drugs he couldn't really say no to his to anything and then and i feel like he's being manipulated all the time by these shady ass characters that are just and he doesn't really see that and at the same time he realizes that is is his problem but he can't really fix it there's a lot of trauma here that's being hinted but not explicit trauma in a way it's very weird i wonder like for anyone who has come across this i would like to understand what what you make of it because even in the way that he talks about love this is very confusing um you know his, his friend makes a comment like i'll bet lots of women will fall for you and then that triggers his whole you know like thought process it's that ends with you know the cathedrals of melancholy are not necessarily demolished if one can replace the vulgar what a messy business it is to be fallen for by the more literary what uneasiness lies in being loved and this last piece what uneasiness lies in being loved 
um, is one of the things that's often quoted about this book. I don't really understand that metaphor or this, this whole train of thought. Um, it's such like it's so removed from the original intention that I feel like his brain is just like doing integrals on a very simple one plus one equals two, and I. I don't know. I'm I'm just very simple that way, and I feel like things should be interpreted the way that they are meant. And if your brain is doing like jumping hoops and hoops in in reinterpreting something, it's it's not the original intention, and that there's no point if it doesn't help help you, like in any way. Um, yeah, like this whole idea of misery and farcicality of life um, he felt you know, entirely removed from the activities of the human beings of the world feeling disoriented um, and and it's important to point out that this like disorientation is not the same as a particular alienation that's described in existentialism I feel like there is still a lot of distinct individuality um, in, or, or that is the basis um, of the Western idea of alienation. Whereas in this, it's like the complete opposite, the total lack of individuality resulting in his sense of removal from the world or lack of recognition, not recognition, lack of... You know, there's this, he feels disqualified as a human being. He felt that he, you know, I had now ceased utterly to be a human being. This is when he was taken to a mental asylum. Um, and he said, also says, my, my unhappiness was the unhappiness of a person who could not say no. And at the end, near the very end, um, he says, this, that is the one and only thing I have thought resembled a truth in the society of human beings where I have dwelled up to now as in a burning hell. Everything passes. It is, it is, it is weird. It, I mean, like, <laughs> but not, I don't want to say it in like such a flippant way, like, oh, I don't understand, or like, this is, this is just totally out of this world. It is a very interesting perspective. This is a very troubled view, clearly very unproductive and I don't and I say that in like a judgmental way but I understand I think um, some of the, the ad, this attitude I'm just I, I can't fully wrap my head around someone who feels like this or the fact that the vast majority of maybe Japanese culture can understand and appreciate this I think that is what is disturbing about this book the fact that the Japanese recognize it and isn't isn't I mean I think anyone would be disturbed by a society or like where you know people can identify with this I can't fully identify with this I can't I, do, I can't realize what might have happened in his childhood no matter how traumatic a childhood could be how do you produce especially one that is like privileged almost in a way like he was never really hungry he was never really beaten like it was a peaceful almost normal you know he went to school he had friends he did things that other kids did how the f like um yeah it, it's uh, he's so this is something i think is worth um just reading as a pastime and just contemplating on the down low I think it's important to read things that we don't fully understand or agree with. I definitely don't fully agree with this. I don't even agree with half of this. So that's why I don't really, um, you know, just 100% recommend it as something that is p remotely pleasurable. I think this is more of an intellectual contemplation for someone who is very strong and have their maybe who is not troubled. So I wouldn't recommend this to my friend, let's say, who is suicidal or like even remotely, I think, might be troubled or depressed. Definitely no. But, you know, for someone who is living their life and is intellectually curious, definitely yes, just because it is a cornerstone of Japanese 
literature apparently and it's worth discussing for with you know like-minded people i think who if you can find any in your own circles that are also interested in this and have read this or that could be an interesting tea topic one saturday afternoon and that'd be the end of that no more like i i can't stand this type of thing i feel like it's a little bit waste of time if you have to uh you know jump through hoops to understand as well but i think it is it is um, fun, maybe, to just talk about it over tea one day. Um, yeah, so that is, those are my thoughts on the four books. There are a lot of interesting, other interesting books that I'm reading now that I can't wait to share with you guys. Um, I hope you have a great day, and let me know what you're reading these days, and if you have any recommendations, I would love to know. Bye.